We greet all of you that are here tonight, joined together with one heart and one mind. We trust with in the same judgment. Welcome those on our live stream also that have joined our fellowship. This will be the 14th message in the series on Christ's coming. The signs, signs of his coming. <clears throat> now, the second coming of Christ is what I have called a pivotal doctrine. It's, it's a doctrine that's essential to sound thought and analysis. A person cannot have proper views of God or thoroughly proper views of Christ or of life or of the new covenant apart from this doctrine. Is this supplies some insight that has to be had by a person who's going to live by faith. Amen. Now the scriptures as we have quite often mentioned mentioned three appearings of Christ. One is in the past. He appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin which set the day of redemption in, in, the, in focus. Then his present appearing is now appearing in the presence of God for us, as Hebrews 9.24. And then Hebrews 9.28 says that, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. It's the same Christ. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Under salvation or without regard to sin or not to deal with sin. It's not that when he comes, only those who look for him will see him. That's not what the text is saying. It's saying only those, he will only appear without sin to those who look for him. Everybody else is going to confront them with their sin. So let's say that we would, let's say that you weren't looking for Christ. You, or you aren't looking for Christ. You had better start tonight. Amen. You must be intolerant with any, any frame of mind that excludes the consideration of Christ coming again. You, yeah. must, you must get rid of that. Any mind that doesn't have that, you've got to get rid of it because it's a delusionary mind. Mm -hmm. So something of this importance, the coming of the Lord, this demands our attention. So you see, the modern uh, preachers and teachers have to account for why they are talking so little about the second coming of Christ. Yeah. They want an answer now to the church. They must be nice. They might be nice people and all of that, but they owe an answer, an explanation. Why is something of this magnitude not on the, mile, on the tongues and in the ears of the people? Why isn't this happening? I will tell you why. It's because they do not believe. Yes. Amen. Uh -huh. I know that this, this is not good church promotion, but this is why it is. Someone who's not looking for Christ isn't even in the house. Right. I say they're not even in the house. Yeah. He that has this hope in him, mm -hmm. not this hope in him, but this hope in him, yeah. purifies himself even as he is pure. The dirty Christians don't have any spot. I'm sorry. They don't have a place yeah. in heaven or in the church either. Amen. There's no place for them. God purged people. He intends for them to take advantage of it because when Christ comes, he's going to deal with people who didn't. Right. And he's going to receive those who did. Amen. And our view of Christ's coming must be right. We don't have the option of being wrong or making a mistake, or having a distorted view of the coming of Christ. I'm sorry we don't have the option to do that. If it's something that concerns Christ, you can't be wrong. If you think you can, exactly what could you be wrong about? Could you be wrong about his death? Or him reconciling the world, or taking away sin? Could you be wrong about that? Can you be wrong about what Jesus is doing now? See, there's, there's the appearance. He, 
appeared once in the end of the world. He's appearing now. He shall appear the second time. And you can't be wrong about any one of these. Why? Because they're woven into the fabric of every aspect of sound doctrine. Every aspect of sound doctrine, these three, th three appearings are woven in there. And they're essential to man's acceptance. Now, our text said, Jesus said this while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. There's only four disciples with him. And the disciples came to him. That's these four disciples. Privately. Saying, tell us. When shall these things be? That he had just talked about. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. Interesting. Three questions in one. Interesting, isn't it? He associated all of these things together. Now, why, uh, what prompted that question? Why did they ask that question? That kind of question is not asked much today, is it? Have you ever heard anybody ask it? Maybe you have. I, I have in my lifetime. What are, the, what are the signs of your coming and the end of the world? Your coming and the end of the world. But, so they must. these two things must be coordinated in some some way. Well, it was prompted by his observation that Jesus had made just previously. It's recorded in Matthew 23, 37 through 24, too. And Jesus had been sitting by the treasury, it's like a treasure box in the temple. He was sitting by this watching how people threw their money into it. <laughs> you know, this is a different kind of Jesus. Did you know Jesus watches how people put money? Yeah. We got an example of it, right? We got an example. He watched how they gave their money. How do, how do you give your money? He, he's watching, see? It's good to consider, isn't it? Here was a dialogue. He said following that, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh to the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came unto him. And they showed him the, the buildings of the temple. Yeah. See, they, he, <laughs> he just got to tell him that the temple's going to pass away. He was watching how they were casting in money, and he saw this widow gave two mites, which is all her living. She emptied her wallet, yeah. a big purse, whatever. Yeah. And he observed, she cast in more than they all. Mm -hmm. Pharisees have been throwing in a lot of money. So the disciples took him out and showed him the buildings as if to say, I mean, we really can't uh, maintain this with widow's mites. Yeah. How is it that they, she gave more than everybody else? Seems like the big givers are the ones supporting the, yeah. that we were asking. Jesus said unto them, See ye not these things? I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All right, that's what prompted this question. This was a big temple. If you've ever seen a depiction of Herod's temple, it was absolutely massive. There's no building like it around here, I'll tell you. It was a massive structure. And he looked at it and he said, Well, there's not even going to be a piece of a wall left. And then when the disciples ask him, Whoa, what's going to be the signs of your coming? And the, this must be, to talk, you must be talking about the end of the world and the end of the world. And so he gave some of the signs. I'm going to give some of them. Now they were given in a, in a way that's confusing to the flesh. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, 
and the end of the world. Yeah. And he speaks about it in such a way that it's pretty hard to distinguish, like he's talking about the temple up to here, and he's talking about the end of the world after that. It's hard to distinguish between the two. But as he's going he's to make it plain now. Talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's on one stone. It's not going to be left upon another. He's not talking about a second coming there. Yeah, right. yeah. That's going to happen about 30 years after this, that we, after this text was uttered. Jerusalem is going to be decimated, and this holy temple was going to be completely sacked mm -hmm. yeah. and destroyed. He tells about the signs of that, and then as I will expound, he passes over to the end of the world. It's going to be there's going to be some similarities between the two. So first of all, here are some signs, particularly applied here to the destruction of Jerusalem, but it has some relevance to the end of the world too. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall be false Christs. The people saying they're Christ that aren't. Or are people being presented as Christ that aren't? There will be false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now those that are against election, like, what do you do with this? Huh? Yeah. What? What do you do with a text like this if you say there's no such thing as election? Like, what do you, exactly do you do with this? God made a distinction of people. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, I understand the tribulation of those days had to do with Jerusalem, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall all see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. See, now that didn't apply to the, to the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem was a preview Amen. Yeah. of the kind of thing that's going to happen. The tribulation he's speaking about is a tribulation that's going to attend the destruction of Jerusalem. And after Jerusalem's out of the way, then he makes a quantum leap to the, end of time, to the end of time. Because everything else is like incidental. Everything is incidental up until that time, when, as far as Christ's appearance are concerned. The destruction of Jerusalem was limited, and it was jurisdictional. It, didn't, it wasn't a world. It was a, just a very small, infinitesimally small segment of the world. God was teaching people something. Amen. Not only was he teaching them the unacceptability of Jerusalem's spiritual posture, he was telling them that there is going to be an ultimate end. Amen. Just like there was for Jerusalem. Amen. The second coming is not regional. Right. It's not jurisdictional. It's global. Or universal. Yet he's talking about it in the same breath. I, this is intentional. See, you have to be interested in these things to try and unravel. And people that aren't interested, they just finally say, well, see, they give up. See, they give up. Jerusalem would recover from its destruction, but the world's not going to recover from its destruction. See, so there's, a, there's some differences here. False Christ had a strong delusion. That preceded the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to precede the end of the world, too. It's going to be a strong misrepresentation of Christ. Now, we are living in probably the most serious misrepresentation of Christ in the history of the world. In my judgment, this is happening in our day. This is the most corrupt view of Christ the world has ever seen. And it is almost universally accepted. All missions are based on the supposition that this is the correct Christ. It is commonly presented. All evangelism 
is done in the presupposition that this is the true Christ. All church service or religious service operates with the presupposition that the Christ being presented today is the right Christ. And I say all, I mean majority. There is a remnant that haven't bought into this, but this is the situation. And the modern church has not taken this seriously, false Christ. They haven't taken this seriously. That's why they buy into all kind of faddish doctrines and novel views of Christ and the smile, great smiling Jesus and so forth. This is why they buy into this, because the Christ that's being talked about is not the real Christ. False Christ, strong delusion. Also, he pointed out that life was going to be going on as usual, just as in the destruction of Jerusalem up until the time they were surrounded by armies, life was just going on as usual. Here's how Jesus said it, Matthew 24, 37, as in the days of Noah, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So it's going to be at a time when everything's just going to be, people are going to be going to work, working at home, going to school, shopping at the stores. Just, people are going to be marrying and giving in marriage just like yeah. they're going to live a long time. They're going to be yeah. planning their retirement plans. and. Yeah. It's one of the signs. Yes. See, when you see this being done without a due regard to Christ's person, mm -hmm. that's one of the signs. Amen. You can say, well, this has been happening all along. Well, that's what Christ is talking about. See, he takes the gap of time mm -hmm. from Jerusalem's destruction to the end of the world, and he just compresses it down. Amen. He doesn't comment on all the stuff happening in between. What he's saying is the world nor Israel either is going to learn from this destruction. Amen. Are they still going to not be ready? See, this should have told them, be ready, because this is a religious city. This is where God put his name. They should have known, but they didn't pick up on it at all. So it'll be life is not only a strong delusion, but life as usual. Mark, he gives a few Signs, these signs appear, apply to the end of the world because the, most of these didn't occur at the destruction of Jerusalem. Mark 13, 8, nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. <laughs> the other place he said, the end is not yet. But in those days after the tribulation, that's the destruction of Jerusalem, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So there's going to be political chaos and disturbance. There wasn't such a thing when there was one, when the world had one government. Like Daniel saw the four great global empires, Babylon and Medes and the Persians, Greece and Rome. There wasn't like political chaos because this one was a global, one world government. That's the only kind they had back in those days. So something's going to change. These, these kingdoms in the interim are going to fall. These global kingdoms are, all, are going to fall. There's going to be jostling for power, and we're seeing some of these things happen now. These are going to be signs that's leading up. See, the, the signs are what's leading up, up to... Nature, the most stable part of nature is the, is the universe out, out aside from the world. This is stable. You can't set your clocks by it. It's so, it's so precise. We've got to 
we're off a second or so, and we got to have a leap year every four years. But this is going to, some kind of disorder is going to happen in the starry heavens with the sun and the moon. It's, they're not going to function like they usually did. That's going to be a sign. Yeah. Now, the, the scientists are all opposed to be able to explain stuff like this. This could be, you know, the sun and the moon have a great effect upon the activity upon Earth. The moon affects the tides, you know. So maybe what's happening on Earth, maybe it's because the heavenly bodies aren't functioning like they were. Huh. Maybe that's what it is, instead of global warming and stuff like this. See, because they kind of govern the atmosphere and so forth that's in the Earth. So when the atmosphere is so different and the heat is exorbitant, although we haven't even near the heat records yet, incidentally, that's a sign the most stable things in nature are going to become unreliable. It's one of the signs. And he said there's a, there are going to be earthquakes in all different places. Different kind of places. Now, in Amos's day, he talked about the great earthquake. So there was some yeah. tremendous earthquake that occurred. It's not identified in Scripture, but it was like one. Mm -hmm. The great earthquake. Uh -huh. But as we approach to the end of time, earthquakes are going to increase. And apparently both number and magnitude. Isaiah and the earth is going to become unstable. Now, Isaiah prophesied in his language that to me speaks of this kind of thing. And Isaiah 24, 20, he said, the earth shall reel to and fro. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> like a drunkard. Shall be removed like a cottage. That is, it's going to begin unstable. It's going to begin to kind of break apart. I don't think all of this will happen suddenly. That would destroy the potency of the signs. But see, man has increased in knowledge the wrong way. Yeah. And so instead of having knowledge, instead of knowledge centered in God, knowledge centers in the wisdom of man. So they've concocted these explanations for this disturbance that yeah. is happening. They see the earth reeling to and fro like a drunkard, and they got explanations. Too much, too much of wrong type of ga methane gas is going up there. And the ozone's being to see. They've got all kind of explanations for it. But God wasn't prophesying a breakup of the ozone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's not what he was prophesying. Because only God can control nature. Man can't control nature, not even Amen. with methane. Yeah. Amen. People should be able to see this. If they could control it, then they could make it rain where there's a drought. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why don't they come forth and do that? Why don't these intelligent people do that? Come on, let's make it rain out there in the Sahara Desert. We could use the space. Yeah, sure. <laughs> See, they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. <coughs> Disruption of the heavenly bodies. Isaiah talked about that, too. Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, Cruel, both with, with wrath and fierce anger, to lay hold, lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to be shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now, it's, this will happen in nature, but it, it, this has happened in, in spiritual nature as well. But you wouldn't know how to explain the obtuseness that's happened in the human race if you, did, if you didn't know this yes. that happened in the natural. This actually will happen. And uh, it's God, when, when ignorance covers the globe, God has done it. Which means he's phasing out. He's phasing the world out. It's just a matter of time, but he's, he's allowing us to see it. 
the breaking down. All kind of records are being set in nature. And see, men, are, they talk about it, they complain about it and so forth. But see, it's God, he's controlling this and he's, it's wake-up signals. Amen. That's what these are. I'm going to punish the world. I'll do it first by making them moan with heat and plagues and drowned floods and earthquakes and I traced one time by a number of earthquakes there's thousands of them that occur every day of varying intensity I listed out one time in a year the number of earthquakes and it was something like 12,000 or something like that and it was unbelievable and it's on the increase it's on the increase they've got whole bodies of people that study earthquakes that are happening with more and more regularity and intensity what is that it's reeling the earth is reeling Amen. to and fro. What the, the weight of sin upon it Amen. is rebelling against rebelling yeah. against the sin. Yeah. Yeah. This happening. And then from God's viewpoint, God's making this yeah. happen. He's teaching men you can't trust in nature. Right. Amen. I'm going to dissolve. That's one of the signs now of Christ's coming. <laughs> Luke commented on this in his gospel. He commented on this too. Luke 21, 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Or that's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem there. Because they, God didn't say look up your redemption drawing nigh when Jerusalem was destroyed. He said get out of there, run to the hills of Judea. Men's hearts feeling for fear. Bird flu. Who remember the first time you heard the bird flu? Yeah. Found out it's pretty serious. All kinds of diseases that the scientists have stamped out, they're resurfacing. Uh -huh. Tuberculosis is back. Uh -huh. Chicken pox is back. Yeah. Uh -huh. What are these are signs of the times? Perplexity. Now we got all kind of government gatherings and global gatherings and regional gatherings to try and figure out what's happening. Everybody's perplexed. Perplexity. It's a sign we're we're, we're coming in toward the toward the close. With God, this time you know it could be a few hundred years. With God, the time isn't the isn't the thing. The length of time isn't the thing. The thing is, this state, the things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Even in nature, they're getting worse, worse, and worse, and worse. These are signs. Distress of nations. We're, we just see now Egypt is one of the, you, you see it's happening all around you. Amen. What's happened? These, some of these kingdoms have been stable for centuries. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, they're unstable. That's God. Amen. Why? Because they were built on man, see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the wisdom of man. Uh -huh. Wars and commotions. <laughs> it almost happens daily. Some new war, some kind of commotion, some kind of riot. It's just happening all the time. Say, well, it's, the reason is because we, can news, we get the news quicker. Well, let me suggest to you that we get the news quicker because these things are happening. Did anyone think about that? Instead of we know, we know about news faster, but it's always been this way. No, it hasn't always been this way, or these prophecies wouldn't have any significance. Amen. God has increased. Daniel said in the last days, knowledge would be increased. Mm -hmm. What kind of knowledge? The knowledge will get this stuff to you yeah. so you know about it the next day, whereas you might not know until the next year yeah. before. <coughs> Men's hearts failing them for fear. Suicides are up. 
because men's heart is failing them. <coughs> then Jesus, he, uh, he made this statement. He said, I want you to learn the parable of the fig tree. Uh, this passage of scripture has been interpreted a variety of ways, so I'll, I'm going to give you what I perceive it to be. Luke 21, 39 to 33. He spake unto them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer's now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Mm -hmm. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now this has particular regard to the destruction of Jerusalem. It has general regard to the end of the world. <coughs> About 40 years after this, Things begin to fall apart in Jerusalem. They had a lot of wars going on within. There was inner tumult in the city. The cities were surrounded by the Roman armies and besieged it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. The destruction of Jerusalem set the tone for man's thinking that what God has determined will come to pass. Now, Jesus said one stone will not be left upon another. This sounded like an impossibility. This sounded, I say, like an impossibility. Now God's going to say, look, I'm going to demonstrate the end of the world. I'm going to demonstrate the end of the world by the destroying of Jerusalem, which is the premier city in the world. This is where I put my name, and I'm going to teach you. I made the world. I'm going to destroy the world. I sanctified Jerusalem. I destroyed Jerusalem. Now for Jerusalem, Mark said, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. I talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. The abomination of desolation is when and Antonicus Epiphany went into the temple and sacrificed a pig in the temple. It's a historic incident. Daniel, people couldn't believe that would happen. That's the abomination of desolation, that God wouldn't let the temple remain after that. After that had happened, that happened because Jerusalem had been unfaithful and God judged it. God see. And a similar thing has happened in the spiritual domain. The ungodly people have come into the temple of God, so far as appearance is concerned, and have offered abominations. And God's not going to tolerate it. And it's time God's people quit tolerating it. And explaining it, yeah. talking about God's love and all that. It's time people got tired of abomination. Amen. Amen. He said with, about Jerusalem, he said, now when you see this, when, this when, you, when the temple's been defiled, and that's the abomination of desolation, they could have defiled some house in Jerusalem or some street in Jerusalem, but the temple, <laughs> when you see that, get out of the city. Get out of it. Now God's saying this similar thing to the church. Book of Revelation, speaking of Babylon the Great, says, Come out of her, my people. Get out of there. Now not many Christians think that take that seriously. They think you're some kind of weirdo because you say that. But this is what Jesus said. This is these are Jesus said this. Get out of there. Why? Because I'm bringing it down. Amen. If you're in there when I bring it down, you'll partake of her plagues. Amen. The reason you get out is not just because it's wrong, is that you be not partaker of her plagues. <laughs> right? That's why you get out. 
So here you see it applied to Jerusalem, and it applied to the end of the world also. As the end of the world draws near, Satan's work is going to appear to be growing and valid. It's going to be generally accepted. What he's promoted is going to be generally accepted. It'll be received as it was from as it was from God. And you can say, well, that shouldn't happen. But see, that's a sign of the end. Yeah, amen. This is going to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, it's going to be it. Corrupt religion is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah, yeah, it's the final thing that God won't tolerate. The nation may depart from God, that's bad. But when the church departs from God, that's worse. Luke talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, Luke 21, 20, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out of it. Let not them that are in the countries enter therein, nor take an excursion to Jerusalem. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Yeah, that was the destruction of Jerusalem. But the destruction of Jerusalem was like a prophecy that what God said is coming to pass. Jesus foretold it. It came to pass. The end of the world has been foretold. It's going to come to pass. This is the parable of the fig tree, see? This is what he's talking about. When the fig tree, when, when the time comes for it to perk up, it brings forth leaves. And you know, oh, summer's, that's the parable of the fig tree. When, when you begin to see these signs are like leaves. It doesn't mean Christ's going to come like tomorrow or next week, although he may. That's not the point. The point is the presence of these things and the increase of these things is shouting loudly to us. Yeah. This is not the time to be slothful. This is not the time to be lazy. This is not the time to have a convenient religion. This is not the time. Amen. Time of the end is drawing near. God's leaking out a little bit of information so you can see it. So you can't trust in nature. You can't trust in religion. You can't trust in politics. He's showing all this. He's demonstrating all this to drive people to go to him. There'll be a bounding sin also at this time. <coughs> I want to once again iterate that what he's talking about here is what immediately precedes the coming of the Lord. Not only what preceded the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew 24, 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's the destruction of Jerusalem, immediately after the next significant event, in other words, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. See, there are people that trust in the heavens. Navigators do. They trust in the heavens. As I understand it, they're not going to be able to do it. The heavens are going to become unreliable. I know there's a spiritual sense of this, but this doesn't seem to be what he's talking about right here. Mark says, "For but in those days after the tribulation, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. The powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. These aren't... Uh, divine powers. Amen. But while things are falling apart on earth, it's not going to be because of what Satan did. Amen. Well, you got to see this. It's going to be because of what God's doing. God's going to be shaking these powers. It isn't that Satan suddenly is going to be prominent and what he's promoting is going to be successful. That's not what he's saying. He said, I'm going to I'm going to rob them of their power. These principalities and powers against which we wrestle, presently wrestle, 
He says, I'm going to take away their powers, <coughs> and I, this is going to be a judgment, direct judgment from me. <coughs> Jesus said there would be a decline of this sort. Many false prophets shall arise, shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, I say because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Yeah. 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 You've seen this happen, have you not? Yes. Uh -huh. You probably know people this has happened to. Yeah. Iniquity has got so common that some people's love has grown cold and still they may, it looks like they're better than the other people, see, by way of comparison, but their love has waxed. They're willing to give God less and less and less. Their love's wax cold. They're willing to live just as though God didn't exist. Oh, they try and keep themselves like moral. The love of many should wax cold. This is telling us this situation is not going to be corrected unless God corrects it, which I understand he will do with, with Israel. When, he, when Israel's veil is lifted, that's the only thing that's going to turn this tide. Yeah, right. The Gentile church is not going to turn it. and It's, it's working an effort, it's working in vain to try and accomplish it. <laughs> so there'll be a disturbance of the natural order. There'll be a bounding sin. It's going to pick up. The decline in the church is going to happen because the love of the, it's going to wax cold. So the church will decline. Now this type of thing was lived out in the destruction of Jerusalem. That was like a miniature destruction of the world in which God said, look, I'll fasten your eyes upon this. Jerusalem still isn't fully recovered from that. Fasten your eyes on this. I want to demonstrate to you in miniature form what's going to happen at the end of the world. And it was in Jerusalem. He, he demonstrated in the destruction of Jerusalem. I told you it was going to happen. And it happened. I'm telling you, the end of the world's going to happen, and it's going to happen. Yeah. See? Amen. Amen. So it was like a prophecy. Signs were foretold about the destruction of Jerusalem. Signs foretold for the end of the world. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be like it's going to be preceded by a collapse of everything men have trusted in except God. It's going to collapse. And men are going to be left stranded on the desert of unbelief, yeah. unable to do anything about it. This is going to accent the fear that will come upon all people. When they see Christ, suddenly it bursts upon them. I'm not ready. Yeah. And I can't get ready. There's no time to get ready. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. that's, why this, that's why these texts are here, brethren. Tell people whatever you think is important. If it's keeping you from God, if it's keeping you from diligence, if it's keeping you from pressing toward the mark, you you got to back off of that. Amen. Amen. you got to back off of it because God, God's told you this end is coming and he hasn't told us. And even Jesus doesn't even know. Jesus has volunteered to lay aside this, uh -huh. this knowledge so he can fellowship with us at expectation. It's imperative, brother. It's imperative that the church be anxious for Jesus to return. Amen. Because if they're not, they won't be ready. And if they're not ready, they're not going in. He said, cut and dry. I mean, Jesus told it, made it quite clear in the parable lock the door. Yeah. Lock the virgin, lead five foolish virgins came back, didn't try to get in. I couldn't get in. So there's going to be some kind of a. Period. I, I, I don't know the, all the ins and outs of it, but there's going to be some kind of a period where people are going to know, huh, I wasted my entire life and there's not a thing I can do about it here now. Amen. The church has quit evangelizing. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is going to happen. Don't you doubt it for a minute. They're going to pack their oil in and go in, yeah. and the door is going to be shut. Not going to be any more outreach. Not going to be any more mowing the lawns for the poor and stuff like this. It isn't going to happen anymore. And Jesus is telling you, the disciples wanted to know. They, they got a sense of, whew, the end of the world. Whew, Christ coming, the end of the world. How, we want to be ready, Master. What are the signs? So he told them, you see, 
they were of such a general order that you can't see, you can't really systematize them. You can't print a track out and say they look for this. You know, it's just it's not that kind of thing. He spoke about it in general. He likened it to Jerusalem, so that you destructed to Jerusalem, so you knew we're talking about sure things here. We're not we're not talking about a hit and miss type situation. So the signs that shall precede him. Only people are familiar with these texts will have any idea what's what's happening. They'll think of what it is. It's that the government's got too lenient with this immorality. That's that's what they'll think has happened. They'll think what we need. We need some new senators. That's what they'll think. We need some peacemakers. We need some some ambassadors to go to these countries and try and make make peace. And that's how they'll think. But this is not how God's people think. They think, oh, I got to get ready. I got to get ready. Because the end is drawing near. I have no idea when it's going to be. Or if it's going to be in my lifetime. I have no idea. But whenever it's going to be, I got to be ready. That's why these signs are spoken this way. That's why he didn't say this is going to happen in 2075. If he'd have said that, you know already what would have happened. People would wait to 2075 to do anything about it. So he tells you it's around the corner. And from God's viewpoint, it is around the corner. <clears throat> See, from God's viewpoint, it is the next significant thing that's going to happen. That's it. So I exhort you to take the thing seriously. Don't try and figure out the signs. Just take them just exactly like he said correlate it with what's happening now around you and take this as God's word to you. Prepare to meet your God. Brother Aaron has our exhortation.